as we continue our in-depth study and the look of the last week of Jesus' life, for our study today, it's still Tuesday. Now you think back, we talked about Saturday, okay, the week, the, the days before, Jesus is hanging out with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and the crowd is gathered up. They want to see Jesus and they want to see this Lazarus guy whom Jesus raised from the dead. Four days dead and he raises it from the grave. I'd like to see that too. So a crowd is gathering. That's on Saturday. Now on Sunday, which we call Palm Sunday, which we're going to celebrate next week, uh, that's when we call it the triumphal entry. He's riding the donkey into Jerusalem for Holy Week. Then we come to Monday. Monday is when he cleared the temple. He get all the money changers out of there. He cast them all out. He was turning over tables, made a whip of cords and run everybody out because they were cheating people. He said, this is a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. Then what happened? There's Tuesday. Tuesday, in your folder, first blank, is a day of controversy. A day of controversy and parables. On Tuesday of Holy Week, Jesus did more teaching than any other day that week. And he had more people out to get him that day than any other day of Holy Week. We spent five Sundays preaching about the last week of Jesus, and we're only on Tuesday. And we haven't begun to cover everything that happened in the last week of his life. As a matter of fact, if you go into the Gospel of John, almost half of the Gospel of John is the words of Jesus during that last week before the crucifixion and the resurrection. But what about the bad guys we talked about last week? Are they still around? Remember we had the, uh, the guys in the black hats out to get Jesus, chief priests, elders, Herodians, Sadducees, and Pharisees out to get him. Now at the end of our re readings last week, the Sadducees stepped up to bat, struck out, and our reading today starts out that, well, since the Sadducees couldn't trap him, the Pharisees are coming back in. It's the ultimate tag team, and they're out to get Jesus. But the wisdom of God in every answer that he gave, made them look foolish. In today's gospel, the attacks continue. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Now, from what I understand, this lawyer is not referring to one of the Ten Commandments. Most of the scholars think that this lawyer is referring to one of the 613, next blank, 613 commandments that the Pharisees had come up with to explain the Ten Commandments that God had given. 613 laws you now need to follow to show you how to follow those Ten that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, in the Pharisee law, some of them were heavier than others. They had more weight to them, meaning they had more punishment if you broke them or the more blessings if you, if you kept those laws. And so they're looking to Jesus and going, which one's the greatest? 365 of these laws were basically thou shalt nots. Thou shalt not do this, that, or the other, which left according to somebody's math, 248 directions for how to live. These are the things you're supposed to do. You know, there's one uh, place in the confession where we say, uh, forgive us our sins of commissions, things we did, and omission, the good things that we didn't do that we should have done. And that was the 248. So which is most important? And they're trying to trick Jesus because different people had different ideas of what was most important. So he turns something that men, the Pharisees, had made really difficult into something very easy. He simplified 613. He even simplified the 10 down to 2. He says the two most important things. Number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Number two, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. One of the translations of the Bible put it this way. I want you to love God with your whole being, with everything that I am. I am to love God, and I'm to love you guys as myself, and you're to love me as you love yourself. This is how we respond to the amazing love that God shows us in Jesus Christ. 
The Pharisees expanded to 613 and he condenses it down to two. You shall love the Lord your God. Love seems to be kind of important in the Bible. I think, you know, it says it a few times in there that love is an important thing. The Apostle John said it this way in 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Anyone who does not love, you don't even know God. Because God is love. Probably the biggest is in the Bible. Because God is love. So my question for you today. If God is love, which love is he? Which love? What are you talking about, Pastor Ed? Well, in English, we have one word for love. But in the, the time of the New Testament, the Greeks had, some people count up to seven words that meant love. And I got to looking at them, and some of them seem to be subsets of other words. So most scholars talk about four basic words that mean love. And we're going to talk about those just a little bit. Um, some of the words, now, the first one I want to tell you about is not even in the Bible. The first one of the four the other three are in the Bible. The first one is eros. Got your pencil ready? Eros is the Greek word for sexual love, passionate love. In the English language, we get what from it? Erotic from that word. Now, if we use it as a proper noun, it's referring to the Greek pagan god of love would be called eros. It's a love of passion, an overmastering passion that seizes and absorbs itself into the mind, which is why the porn pornography addiction is so hard to beat because it just really seeps into your mind. It's a love that has an emotional involvement based on body chemistry, okay? It's self-satisfaction. Even though Eros is directed towards someone else, it actually has itself in mind. What's in it for me is Eros love. I love you because you make me happy. That is an eros love. The foundation of this type of love is a characteristic in which something about that other person pleases you. You know, something about them. And if that thing about that other person no longer exists, then they would say, I don't love you anymore. You know? Eros looks for what it can receive. For what it can receive. If it does give, it only gives in order to receive. It fails to get what it expects. It's bitterness and there's disappointment because Eros love did not get what it wanted. Ladies, has your husband ever been disappointed that he didn't get what he wanted? Did he pout like a little baby? <laughs> I'm glad Susan's not here today. <laughs> oh. uh, the philosophy of Eros is that being loved depends on being attractive in some way to the other person. And it's, it's a dependency kind of thing. It's a conditional, a conditional love. I'll tell you about an actor that I read about and, and heard about a while back. His name is John Derrick. Some of the younger people will have no clue these names that I'm going to give you, but maybe you can find out later or you can Google it. John Derrick married a ballerina. Her name was Patty Beers Edistoff back in 1948. But after he married this beautiful ballerina, he walked out on his family in 1955 after meeting a young Swiss actress named Ursula Andress. Yes, some of you remember her. In 1957, after finalizing the divorce from Beers, he married Andress, Ursula, in a Las Vegas ceremony, which those are so meaningful. <laughs> now, actually, my brother got married in Las Vegas, and he, I watched the thing, and it was a very Christian wedding. It was a really good one. It wasn't Elvis, so, you know, we lost points there. But it was a nice wedding. But see, what goes around comes around. After he had walked out on his family, guess what Ursula did to him? She left him in 1965 for French actor Jean-Paul Belmondo. I like saying Jean-Paul. I don't know. After that, John Derrick becomes involved with an American actress named Linda Evans. Who remembers Linda Evans? Who remembers the Big Valley? All right, yeah, the Big Valley. And he married her because she, she had a good look about her. And if you look at pictures, she looked a lot like Ursula Andress did, you know. And so he marries her, and uh, he takes uh, Linda, and, and, and they find this little high school dropout, little 16-year-old girl, and he says, I think she'd be good at movies. Me and you and this 16-year-old girl, we're going to go to Greece, and we're going to shoot a movie over there, okay? 
Well, guess what happens while he's in Greece with this 16-year-old girl? Yeah, no, the 16-year-old girl has an affair with John Derrick now. And so Linda Evans says, no, no way, I'm out of here. She goes back to America, divorces him. Now, she's 16, this little girl is. And uh, he says, well, I've got to stay in Greece until she's 18 so I don't get charged with statutory rape. Because that would be highly illegal. Her name is Kathleen Collins. All right? So Linda goes back. The divorce is finalized. And he then wants to marry Kathleen Collins. You probably know her better as Bo Derrick. If you've seen the movie 10. So why am I telling you all this stuff about John Derrick? Because of an interview I saw with John and Bo several years ago. Because he's, he's passed away now. But in the interview, the lady says, you've been married to some very beautiful women. If Bo, who's sitting right there in the interview, if she loses her looks, will you stay with her? He says, I don't know. I don't know if my wife loses her looks, if I would stay with her. Can you imagine the confidence that builds when your spouse says something like that? You know, I mean, really, if you're blessed to live to a good old age, I promise you, you're not going to look like you're 21 anymore. And so what's going to happen when that happens? I want to have the kind of marriage where I'm sitting on the front porch in a rocking chair, rocking, holding Susan's hand. That's the kind of marriage I want to have. I think we've already gotten there, come to think of it. <laughs> His marriage appears to have been based on Eros, love. And when things would change, he said, I don't know if I can stick it out. Now, guys, I want to talk to you for a second. If most of us were truthful, we would have to admit that the first time we saw the woman that became our spouse, we weren't in love, we were in lust. My goodness, this chickadee is hot and fine. I tell you what, I got to get to know her a little better. And so it starts that way. But it can grow into something different and deeper and more meaningful. And that's where we come up to storge love. Storge is a love for family. Okay? Storge is a love that exists between husbands and wives in a good marriage. When they've grown deeper in their relationship with each other. When romantic love has grown and matured, we call it storge. It's a love that I would have for my mom, my dad, if he was still here. I guess I still got it for him because I'll see him again. For my kids, I have that storge love. For my brothers, sisters if I had them, but I don't have any sisters. So it's that kind of a love. It's a family love. If your family is not dysfunctional. Now, I promise you, some families, you can just watch them and there's not storge there. But in a normal, things work right, how they're supposed to, that's it. Another type of love is phileo. Phileo has been described as a brotherly love. That my best friend, not just my Facebook friend, but a good friend, a close friend, somebody I hang out with or at least like to hang out with. Phileo is a higher love than eros, but not as high as storge because of this. It's involved about our happiness our happiness as opposed to my happiness you know in eros i just want to be happy i don't care what happens when i got a good friend i want to make sure my friend's happy too i want to make sure things are good with them i care about them it involves giving as well as receiving it, it, it's appreciation and kindness in that other person that brings you to a phileo love guys Again, I'm going to talk to you because this is true and you know it. We have a hard time telling other guys that we appreciate their friendship, don't we? And if something comes over us and we're going to tell them that we love them, we're going to take on that Budweiser commercial tone. I love you, man. All right. You know, because if anybody heard us tell another guy we loved them, oh my gosh. You know, America has a confusion between Eros love and Phileo love. They don't understand a brotherly love that can happen. Women don't have that problem. You know, Look on Facebook. I see women all hugged up against each other. Just hug for the picture. You never see two guys hugging on Facebook that close. And if, if it's delete that, delete, 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 you know. Women don't have a problem with that. But when the Apostle John tells us that anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love, he doesn't use any of those forms of the word love. Okay, the word he uses, the word that's in the Bible far more than any other for love is agape. Agape is a godlike, self 
sacrificing. It's a self-sacrificing love. Unconditional love. It means to love the undeserving person. To love despite disappointment in that person. To love even though you're rejected by that person. It delights in giving. And this love keeps on giving even when the person that you're trying to love is unresponsive to your affection. Is unkind or is unlovable and unworthy. It's a consuming passion for the well-being of other people. Today in America, we're, possess we're just possessed with thinking about love as a feeling. And agape doesn't really fall into the feeling category. Agape is love because of what it does, not because of how it feels. Agape is an action love. It's going to do things for other people. For God so agape the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him will not perish but have eternal life it did not feel good to god the father to send his son to this earth to be tortured and crucified for me and you but because of agape he sent him anyway it did not feel good for jesus christ to say i'm going to the cross tomorrow matter of fact in the garden of gethsemane he prayed lord if there's another way He's praying so hard that blood droplets form on his forehead. If there's another way, take this cup from me. But because of agape love, he says, but not what I want. What you want is what needs to be done. The point is that agape love is not simply an impulse generated from feelings. It's an exercise of the will. It's a renewing of the mind to love someone like that. This is why when God says, I command you to love your enemies. He's not commanding you to feel good about your enemies. He's commanding you to make a decision to love them anyway with an agape love. Agape love is related to obedience and commitment. Loving someone is to obey God on someone's behalf. Here's a verse from John 14. The way that we know we love, that we agape God, is that we keep his commandments. Jesus said, whoever has my commands and obeys them. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. There are Christians in this world who say that they love God. Oh, yeah, I love God. I'm a spiritual person. But then they don't do anything to obey what God has laid out in Scripture, to live a lifestyle according to what God has laid out for us to do. I mean, to try. We're never going to get it right perfectly. But to try to live like he wants us to live. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. John 14. Now it's Thursday of Holy Week. The night before Jesus transformed the Passover meal into a communion meal, into the Lord's Supper that we know it today. It's the very night he was betrayed. He was arrested. He was deserted. And he says this. I give you a new command. I give you a new command. That you love one another. Now that's not new. The Old Testament is full of places telling us to love one another. He says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. What did Jesus give for you? Gave his life for you. That's an agape type of love. And he goes on to say, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, people outside the church, and really sometimes people inside the church, are going to rate us as disciples on how well we agape. Do they really love me in a godly love? It means loving people that are hard to love. So, question comes in, do you know anybody that's hard to love? You work with somebody that's hard to love? Terry, don't you raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Is someone in your family hard to love? To love. Okay? Well, I'm going to let you on a little inside secret. It's pastoral code. If you hear us talking about an EGR, that's an extra grace required person. I have got to exhibit far more grace when I deal with this person than dealing with someone I have a phileo love for, a brotherly love for. They're hard to deal with. i got to have more grace. Help me, Lord, have more grace when i got a meeting with this person. Extra grace required. Several years ago, I was dealing with a church member who was an EGR. I was exhausted from dealing with the situation and the conflict that was constantly coming up. And I ran across a quote from a Presbyterian minister. It meant so much to me that it hangs on the wall in my office and has been there over a year now. Look at your insert. We're gonna, I'm going to read that. I want you to follow along with me there. 
Pastor Tim Keller said this, and it's so true. Think about it. If you love a person whose life is all put together and has no major needs, it costs you nothing. It's delightful. And you see the little dot, 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 that means they left something out. He goes on to say, you got to find at least four or five people like this. you got to make them your friends. you got to hang on to these people because they're good to have around. Then he goes on. But if you ever try to love somebody who has needs, someone who is in trouble or who is persecuted or emotionally wounded. You know anybody that's emotionally wounded? They, I mean, they've been through some stuff. It's going to cost you. You can't love them without taking a hit yourself. A transfer of some kind is required so that somehow their troubles, their problems, transfer to you. Anybody taking psychology in college? Yeah, they teach about it there. Transference. It's got to be transferred. There are a lot of wounded people out there. Is that true or not? There are a lot of wounded people out there. They are emotionally sinking. They're hurting and they desperately need to be loved. And when they're with you, you want to look at your watch and make a graceful exit. Because listening to them with all their problems can be grueling. If I walk down the hallway and you duck out into another room, I'm going to say, uh-oh, what have I done? You know? It can be exhausting to be a friend to an emotionally damaged person. The only way they are going to start filling up emotionally is if somebody loves them and the only way to love is to let yourself be emotionally drained. You've got you to drain yourself when you're dealing with them. Some of your fullness is going to have to go into them. You have to empty out to some degree. If you hold on, then stay in your emotional comfort level. He says they are going to sink emotionally if somebody doesn't love them with an agape love. They're going to sink emotionally. I want to close with two stories about love. The first is a woman who was bitten. This is years ago before we had our vaccinations and our treatments for rabies. She was bitten by a rabid dog. And the doctor says you need to put your affairs in order. You're, you're probably not going to make it. And so the woman takes out a pen and paper in front of the doctor and she starts writing furiously. I mean, she's writing and writing. She fills up a page and he says, my goodness, how long is your last will and testament? And she said, last will and testament? This is the list of the people I'm going to bite before I die. <laughs> E-G-R, I'm telling you. But to close on a little better note, a story of agape. It's the 17th century. Oliver Cromwell had sentenced a soldier to be shot for his crimes. Remember when back in the day, and it was firing squad. Line them up, however many rifles are there, aim for the chest, and shoot them because of the crime. Now, the time that this is going to be is when the bell in the bell tower. Remember when they have big, huge bell towers, and they would have these massive bells, and the, the big clangor would boom and ring against it? He said, when that bell rings at evening curfew, Fire your shots. So he's lined up, got his blindfold on, tied to the post. Firing squad is lined up and ready. But there's no bell at the time. His fiance, the soldier's fiance, had climbed up the bell tower, had wrapped her arms around that clanger inside that bell and hung to it so tightly so that when the clanger slammed against the bell, it slammed her body into that metal bell, but no sound rang out. The bell never rang that night, so they didn't shoot. Cromwell was kind of furious that this went on. He summoned her and said, come in here, what is going on? Why have you done this? And she said, I love him. And she's in tears as she showed him the bruises on her body from being slammed against that bell. She shows him the blood on her hands from hanging on there. And Cromwell was touched. And he says, your lover, your lover shall live because of your sacrifice. Curfew will not ring tonight. And it's because of the agape sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and his bleeding hands that when your final curfew comes in, it won't be to eternal death, but to eternal life through faith in his sacrifice, his agape gift to you. Amen.